Well, good morning, Grace people. Good to see you this morning. Here we are in uh, weather that feels like fall, even though it's still summer. That's Minnesota. Yeah, indeed. But when we start to get to days like this, where uh, it's easy to confuse the two, you know that we're coming towards the end of summer. And that means that we're also moving towards the end of our summer sermon series that we have been in. We've been in the book of Hebrews. There are 13 chapters in the book of Hebrews. We're coming into chapter 10 today, so that means only three chapters left. We're moving our way through. We've covered a lot of ground in this book in our current sermon series entitled Connecting the Dots of Faith. And that's what we've been hoping you have been doing and allowing the Holy Spirit to do in you as we've been reading through Hebrews and as we've been preaching through Hebrews. Hebrews, as we said from the very beginning, uh, it's, it's a book in the Bible, but really it probably was a sermon to begin with that got like transliterated into or added to a little bit more by the author to make it into something that would be printed and, and ultimately shared as a letter from church to church to church. But it shares so much in it of what a, a sermon would have in it, and one of those things that it has in it is a lot of repetition. <laughs> There's a lot of themes that are just repeated over and over and over again throughout the book of Hebrews, throughout this one sermon, because the, the preacher, the author, wants to get his point through. Because there's important points that this author is trying to make, that the preacher is trying to make to this early, early church. This early church, as I said before, was made up most likely of Jewish believers. Some of the first believers in Jesus, most of them were those of the Jewish faith first. And they had turned their trust over to Jesus. But now as, as the generation was starting to go by, as period of time was starting to go by, some who were within that church we're starting to long for the good old days. We're starting to look back and think, you know what, maybe the, the Jewish sacrificial system, maybe those things that we could hold on to, that we could understand, that were tangible, that were rules and regulations easy for us to manage, maybe that was better than Jesus. And the thing that keeps coming again and again and again from the author of Hebrews is Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater, and he wants those who are listening to not lose sight of this critical message that Jesus is is greater. And so he, he brings words of encouragement. He brings words of metaphor and reminder of, of who Jesus is and how he related to, to the Jewish sacrificial system. So there's a lot of theological themes that can get kind of deep in here. So I would encourage you, go back and read or reread the book of Hebrews. Maybe pick up the, one of the Bibles that we have that we use for reading here that's got some great commentary in it to help you understand a bit more of what's being said within this book of Hebrews. But if you want to go back and take a look at some of the sermons that we've already preached over the course of this summer, that might be helpful too. But we're going to dive in today into chapter 10. And the nice thing about chapter 10 is it includes in it kind of a, a, an encapsulation of a lot of what the author of Hebrews has been talking about all the way up to this point, along with some encouragement. So let's jump in right today in chapter 10 with these words, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Lot of language in there that is metaphor, a lot of references back to the Jewish sacrificial system and the way things worked in the temple. We've been talking about that over the course of these weeks, but it's a good reminder here to see what the author's getting at here. He's going, listen, listen, this, this work of Jesus, this work of Jesus has permanently opened the way for you to be able to enter into the presence of God, to receive everything that you need by simply trusting in Jesus and by holding unswervingly to this faith in the one true God who is revealed to us in Jesus. It's amazing. It's powerful. It's encouraging. Do you feel a little bit of encouragement coming your way today? All right. Amen. I'm glad. I'm glad because hold on to your seats. 
buckle up, because here's where it goes next. Verse 26. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, and who has insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Wow. Pretty hard. Pretty hardcore. Amongst some of the most direct and explicit warnings you will find anywhere in Scripture, certainly anywhere in the New Testament. Right here. And let me be clear when I say this. This passage was not written to the non-Christians. It wasn't written to those out there. It was written to the church. It was written for the believers in that early church. And it still applies to us today. And if that makes you nervous, good. It means you're paying attention. If we deliberately keep on sinning, all that's left is the fearful expectation of God's judgment. Whoa! So let me ask you a question, and it's a rhetorical one, so don't raise your hand and don't shout out an answer. Have you ever deliberately sinned since you came to faith in Jesus? Well, according to some interpretations of this passage... Your answer to that question is the difference between life and death. The difference between heaven and hell. The difference between salvation and damnation. So maybe we had better pay attention to what is actually being said in these few verses of Hebrews because there is so much at stake. You know, when I was a young Christian, I remember hearing another passage in scripture a passage that that jesus spoke in matthew chapter 12 and it and it shares some parallels in the kind of language and warning that come through and i want to share these with you today it's from matthew chapter 12 beginning at verse 30 these are the words of jesus he said whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters And so I tell you, every kind of sin and slander can be forgiven, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. I remember hearing those words... (laughs) And reading those words as a young Christian, and when I did, it scared me out of my mind. Because how do you know? Right? I mean, how do you know? Did, did I say something that blasphemed the Holy Spirit? I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think so. But what, what if I did? How would I know? Have I ever deliberately done something sinful since I've come to know Jesus? I'm not asking anybody else to raise their hand, but I'll raise it for me. Yeah. So now what? What do we do with this passage? What is being brought forth in this passage? Because how do I know? How do I know if I have deliberately sinned and am now bound to eternal judgment and hell? How am I supposed to know? Throughout my years of pastoral ministry, I've heard people ask a question 
that's related to this. It's a simple question. Pastor, do you believe that someone could lose their salvation? It's an interesting question, but here's the thing. I think the nature of that question and what I have observed in the hearts and minds of people who often ask that question is a misunderstanding about the nature of salvation and of these warning passages in Scripture. You see, sometimes when we speak those words, do I think I could lose my salvation? Or do I think somebody else could lose their salvation or has lost their salvation? I think sometimes that's treating salvation like it's a commodity or a possession. Like, like my car keys. Well, I've got my car keys. I'm glad I've got them. I know where they are. They're right here. I try to hang them up every night so I know exactly where they'll be the next morning. But sometimes I've laid them down and I've lost them. What do I do? I go to my wife, of course. <laughs> Angela, have you seen my car keys? I don't know where they are. I've lost them. Or maybe it's my wallet, or maybe it's my reading glasses, or any number of things, right? And the question becomes, what did I do? Did I lose it? And sometimes I hear people saying the same thing or implying the same thing when they say, can you lose your salvation? I mean, I've got it. I've got my salvation. I know right where it is. I've got it right here. At least I hope. Except that morning that I woke up and I didn't know where my salvation was. Have you seen my salvation? I think I lost it. Oh my goodness, what do I do now? Where do I go to find it? It's a misunderstanding of the nature of salvation. Hear me when I say this, brothers and sisters. I don't have salvation. I have a Savior. I have a Savior. And that makes all the difference in the world. I don't possess salvation with some kind of fear that I might lose it tomorrow. I have a Savior. And the message being driven home by the author of Hebrews is, listen, we have a Savior who is so much greater than any kind of, of salvation you think you can just hold on to or manage for yourself. You have a Savior, the creator of the universe, the one who was there at the very beginning, that one, his name is Jesus. I have a Savior, and I'm so glad I do because I can't manage my own sin. And how foolish it is to, to try. <laughs> Listen, you aren't good enough to manage your own sin, let alone manage your salvation, and neither am I. But here's where the warning comes through. You see, if we think we can, if we think somehow that we can manage our salvation or manage our sin, that is where the danger is. That is where the warning comes. I think some people get into the mindset of treating the grace of God like training wheels. Like, oh, you know what? You, you have grace when you're a young Christian. You know, when you, just, when you just need a little bit of help. But then when you mature, well, well, then you figure it all out. Then you begin to work under your own power. You begin to understand all the things of the world and, and the ways in which you can, you can be a better person and, and, and serve better and do better. And you, you don't need that grace so much anymore. Friends, you don't ever outgrow grace. You grow into grace. And you don't grow up in the law. <laughs> but you also don't outgrow the law. The law always points us back to our Savior. It reminds us what we can't do that only he can do. And we never outgrow our need for grace, ever. I've said it before and I'll say it again. The most mature followers of Jesus I've ever known are the sweetest, most gracious, filled people I've ever known in my life. 
These are the people who you want to be around. These are the folks who, no matter where you've been or what you've done, you come into their presence and they just ooze the grace of Jesus. And when you're broken and downhearted and, and, and struggling, you come to them and they're the ones who just, who just put that balm on you. Like Pastor Angie was sharing in the kids' message today. It, 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 it's, it's sweet. It's rich. It's full of life and love. And it's so much greater than anything that you can come up with yourself. You see, to, to do anything else, to find any other way to just manage our own sin, that's where the warning in Hebrews comes through. That's where the warning is that, that to do that, to try and manage it ourselves or come up with our own way of doing things or to trust in any other way, most likely ourselves, is to trample the Son of God underfoot or to treat as unholy the blood of the covenant that has sanctified us or to insult the spirit of grace. That's what it means to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. It's not a gotcha moment. It's not some sin that you have to be thinking around going, boy, boy, I just it's hidden somewhere. I don't know what it's going to be. No, it is a rejection of the grace of God. Can you lose your salvation? Wrong question. Can you lose your Savior? Uh, guess what? You're the one who was lost. <laughs> your Savior found you. Can your Savior lose you? No. In fact, Jesus says nothing can snatch you out of his hands. But what we can lose is our faith. And just as we have been saying over and over again, and what the author of Hebrews is trying to drive home, is it's all about faith. At the end of the day, faith is trusting in Jesus, not in ourselves, not in a system, not in any worldly system, any religious system, any political system, any moral sin management system, none of those systems. It's trusting absolutely in Jesus. He is the one who rescued me. He is the one who is my Savior. Do I believe in his promise? That answer is yes. Lord, help my unbelief. <laughs> but when the focus is on Jesus, when we place our faith in him, then there is encouragement. Then there is hope. Then there is a future. Then there is eternity. Then there is life. And the author of Hebrews himself knows it as he writes. Because right after this passage, he encourages his listeners to remember. Now hear this as he continues on, starting at verse 32. Remember those earlier days after you had received the light, when you endured in a great conflict full of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith. And I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. This is the encouragement of faith for us, brothers and sisters. What is this work of God? What is this will of God? <laughs> what is it that we must do? John 6, 29 says it plainly in Jesus' own words. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. It's all summed up right there. 
Don't believe in anything else. Don't put your faith anywhere else. Let it be solely in the one who loved you, created you, has rescued you, and continues to rescue you every day of your life. The one who has found you when you were lost. The one who loves you even when you were unlovable. The one who gives you his favor even though you don't deserve it and neither do I. Jesus has saved you. Do you believe it? If not, have faith and receive that gift from him today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, here we are once again, Lord, gathered as your people in your presence and reminded once again, Lord, of, of how quickly and easily we stray. Lord, your word teaches us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and lead us into your good work of salvation, Lord. Thank you for that work that you've done for us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, I pray that whoever's listening today, Lord, who might be struggling today, who might be wondering, Lord, or has ever asked that question, Lord, how, how do I know? How do I know that God has saved me? Lord, would you give them the gift of faith? It comes from you anyway, Holy Spirit. Give that gift of faith to anyone today who is struggling, to anyone today who is wondering, to anyone today who is wandering, Lord. Give them that gift today. Not a faith in their own goodness, not a faith in their own self-righteousness, but only a faith in you. Faith in you and you alone, Jesus. We believe your word. We believe what you have said. And all that we can do is as God's people say amen and amen.